joined by uh, Elizabeth Funch from Anne Arundel County and Dave Gottesman from Montgomery County. Uh, we're all from Maryland. I'm, um, I'm Ben Burge. I'm with the Anne Arundel Economic Development Corporation. Um, today, we're talking about how we communicate and promote and sell uh, performance metrics, performance outcomes to leadership. Um, anybody who's worked in this field knows that that can be challenging at times. Um, it's easy when we're sitting with our teams and we're talking about performance metrics and how to build them and why they're important and all the contributions that they can make to inform how an agency is performing, how it's functioning, what the budgetary priorities are, a whole host of, of items that are associated with it. Um, but sometimes we face some challenges, how to explain to leadership why this is important. Um, it's, and a lot goes into that. It's everything from what you're measuring and why to uh, what it looks like and uh, why other people care. So we're gonna be covering a whole host of, of issues related to uh, working with leadership to um, uh, educate them and promote uh, the importance of performance metrics. And we encourage all of you, if you have questions you'd like to submit or comments that, that you'd like us to discuss, um, feel free to enter them into the chat and they'll get communicated to us. And uh, we look forward to your involvement and interaction during this. And um, I'm gonna, uh, I am serving as both a panelist and a quasi, not really a moderator, I'm more of the uh, MC to get things going. But we're all going to be contributing equally and discussing uh, these various topics. So I'm going to throw the first one out there. Um, all three of us have had the experience of either being on the ground floor of launching a stat program or a performance program um, or reviving one. Uh, so I'm going to throw uh, the first question out, which um, to talk, ask, ask the team to talk about um, the initial sell that was being made to the leadership team you work with in setting up a performance program or a stat program. Um, so, um, Elizabeth, I'm going to throw it to you first. You're you're kind of on the ground floor with the Rundel stat. Uh, right. Rundle stat's almost a year old now. Um, oh and and talk about how you've been working with uh, the leadership team in Anne Arundel County to get it going. So yeah, so as Ben said, my name is Elizabeth French and I'm the Arundel Stat Manager in Anne Arundel County, Maryland. So we are just officially under a year old. Um, in about 18 days, we will, we will reach the one year anniversary of officially launching Arundel Stat. So um, one of the county, execu county executives campaign promises or was talking about um, bringing back trust in government, or I guess what, that was one of the things he talked about. And doing that, transparency and data are, are there, and that's how that can be done. So as part of that, in his very first budget proposal, a Rundle stat was included and approved, and um, I came on board to help start it. Uh, so from my point of view, as far as the county executive leadership, the buy-in was there. They wanted it, it was important. And it wasn't just putting together these performance plans. There was also launching an open performance site in order to get the information out in the public. So for me, it was really starting to talk with the leadership of each of the individual departments. Um, and what I found in those early conversations was some of the hesitation was around extra work for their team. They, you know, this was coming down from um, the county exec. We wanted to do performance. We wanted to put plans together, but they were really worried about well, what was that going to look like for my team? And so for me, one of those early conversations was around, we're not looking to add additional work to what your team is doing. Your team is probably already collecting all the data necessary it's all there. We need to look at it, look and see what there is. And essentially what we're doing is reframing it, highlighting it. It could be that some of it is going to be very useful. And through this process, we might find that we are sort of collecting widgets. And if they're not useful, maybe we can talk about it's no longer necessary. 
So really kind of articulating that this was not an exercise in creating extra work for their staff, but utilizing the work they were already doing was kind of one of the first steps in getting that de department leadership on board for moving the process forward. Dave, what did you, how, how was it when you um, sort of brought the, the Dave Gottesman brand to Montgomery County? <laughs> so staff? I'm actually gonna reach back a little further. It's, it's good to be without everybody here. Um, again, my name is Dave Gottesman. I'm the County Staff Manager for Montgomery County, Maryland. But to answer this question, I'm actually gonna reach back a little bit further. Um, my, my prior job before coming to Montgomery County was to create a stat program in a township in New York. Um, it was, you know, my, my first hand at this. Uh, this is the town of North Hempstead, right, right outside of New York City uh, in Nassau County, Long Island. But in New York, many of the services that may be delivered on the county level here are delivered at the town level. So the, the paving, the plowing, the permitting, and, and so forth. So when I think about that era, and this is going back to around 2008, you know, the hat tip really has to go to Martin O'Malley, who started this work in Baltimore. Um, and what you saw, if you if you were around back then, is mayors and county executives and town supervisors picked their head up and said, "Hey, what you know, what's going on over there? That that sounds really interesting and exciting, and I I want a little bit of that." And the, the, the buy-in from leadership that Elizabeth mentioned happened um, pretty organically and, and not gradually at all. It was, it was a wave, I think, and from, you know, from what I saw. And the sell didn't necessarily have to be made to the top leadership. They had to, they had to champion it. And, I, I, and any one of these panels or discussions I've ever been part of when someone says, what's the secret sauce? It's the support from the top leader. If you do not have that, you know, you're, you're, it's, it's a problem. And that's all, it's been said so much, it's almost cliche, but it's true. Um, and you also didn't necessarily have to sell the idea to the public, to your taxpayers who wanted increased accountability or transparency, you know, or a way to understand the, the effectiveness of, of, um, of their government. But sometimes it was the layers in between that you had to sell it to. But one of the things that I distinctly remember in those early days of, of creating a stat program from scratch was when, when, when peers, uh, professional or, or personal friends would ask, oh, what are, you, what are you doing in your new job for the town of Hempstead? Tell me about your new gig. And I would explain to somebody what the, you know, what the stat program was. Everybody was just like, duh. Like, like that, of course you are. Of course, that's how an organization has to be run. Of course, you have to, you know, have metrics. Of course, you have to use data. It was, it was almost like, um, I have a colleague in, in Montgomery County who, who runs our, um, our innovation program. He, he teaches, you know, lean, lean process improvement and, and related principles. And when he talks to, you know, he, he tells this great story that when he explained his job to his grandmother, his grandmother said, oh, you teach common sense? I mean, and that, that's kind of, you know, what, you know, what, what it is, it's, this is the, the 21st century, century way of managing an organization. And if you're not using data and you're not using metrics, you know, then you're, you're already left behind. Yeah, I think um, a, a couple things um, to follow up uh, on what you said, I, I totally agree. I think a lot of us, certainly a lot of us uh, in this part of the country, not just in Maryland, but in the Mid-Atlantic area, um, all recognize slash revere slash appreciate the steps Martin O'Malley took as mayor of Baltimore when he set up, when he, when he took the CompStat program from the New York City Police Department and applied it to government, to local government, and created Baltimore City Stat and kind of made our work a profession uh, and not just an adjunct of another department. Um, and that was, that was very useful. At the same time, we're very fortunate to be in Maryland because like you said, a lot of other leaders saw that and said, wow, it, you know, city stats doing all these great things. Um, later it was state stat when he was governor um, and, but still, it still permeated down. And that was what certainly uh, got, uh, the county executive I work for in Prince George's County, Richard Baker, why he wanted to set up a staff program. Um, he wasn't 100% sure why, he just knew it worked. 
and it was a reform. And Prince George's County at that time, let's just say, was needing a bit of reform back then. They had a, uh, a few problems uh, with Mr. Baker's predecessor. And there was a, there was a, there were not only organizational problems, but there was a reputation of corruption and this transparency of, of, a, of an ethics commission of a, a county staff program were, were designed to bring back good government, make it user friendly, make it so people can see how government is performing. And I, I completely uh, agree with your other main point, which is we used to joke in our office in Prince George's, which, oh, by the way, I'd like to point out, I still have my Prince George's County stat mug right here. Um, but we used to call it government 101. Everybody thought we were making things complicated and gee whiz maps and technology and GIS and blah, blah, blah. But it was government 101. It's what are you doing? Where are you doing it? How long is it taking you to do it? Everything after that is just, is, is details. But um, I, I think that, um, you're right that uh, we, we've all, that, all had that same experience with the leadership saying, I want it. They're not 100% sure what it is, um, but, but having that trust um, from the leadership to say, okay, you, you're the expert, go, go build this, um, is really a key. Um, I would say that there's one element that I think's missing that I think's important for people to remember that even if your leadership buys into it, the department heads who don't like it and push back, they don't just push back to the stat office. They talk to the county executive or the mayor too. So you gotta you gotta kind of navigate these tricky waters of pushback that um, that are inevitable. Um, but Elizabeth, I think you raised a, a good point: is we want to focus on just let's just work with what you have. Let's not reinvent the wheel. Um, it's all out there. Um, so I think in in terms of a chronological way. Um, so we've got leadership on board. They want a program. So what are the main things we're pitching to them to make them really embrace it and operationalize it and feel comfortable talking about it? So what do we tell them the, the main goals of this program are? I think one of the goals is it really it takes the opportunity. I think sometimes we feel that government departments work in us, our silos that kind of um, environment, uh, the Department of Environment does this, DPW does this, inspections and permits does this. Like, it's very easy to think about those government departments that you yourself might have to interact with. But I think sometimes we miss that really there's work across governments that goes into fulfilling, um, making our um, neighborhoods safer, public safety, um, education, um, transparency, like there's these buckets that the terminology might change from administration to administration, but inherently it's sort of the same work. We're working towards better communities. We want safe schools for our kids, but it's not just one department and the work that one department does that might make our community safe. It's actually work that happens in different departments. So I think one of the selling points is when we start to talk about performance, we can start to see the work across departments that goes into kind of a broader county goal. The, the way I would answer that question um, is, you know, every every leader has goals. It might be uh, a, a goal that they campaigned on. It might be um, a, a goal that is that is part of any local government, which is something like public safety or uh, cleanliness or no potholes or you know you know e transit. There are certain things that we we all do, even though our organizations don't look exactly the same across the country. Um, but you know to them or if, you know, first I guess you have to determine how hard they need to be sold. You know, like you said, Ben, they, they, they know they want it, they want something. So it's, it's about having a, a discussion where you get them to focus on what are the three, four, five, seven things that they want to achieve in, in their first term or the, the term and then translating that into 
you could kind of take two roots here. You could translate it into the indicator kind of measure, the very high level um, community level or county or city or statewide level metric, uh, and then boil it down further into the department level, the more operational where the rubber meets the road kind of measures. And you know, you, you show them the, the, um, uh, the, uh, the flow, if you will. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a, a, a dozen names for it, right? Of, of the different frameworks that, that people use when you think about creating that line of sight between the person out in the field doing the work and the front lines and then the high level goal that the, uh, the elected leadership has. But you have those, you know, you've got to have those discussions, you've got to boil it down into the metrics, and then you've got to show that you can deliver on those metrics from, you know, pulling data out of a, a system or a, a person's spreadsheet that they keep or yeah, a case management system or whatever the county uses. Um, the nice thing is, is, you know, if you're just starting in this work, it, it, um, the reality is, is you don't need complicated software to make this work. After the commitment, if you have Excel, you can do a whole lot to get a program like this off the ground. And that's how many of us started. I know I, I certainly did in North Hempstead. And then, you know, I was blessed to come to Montgomery County where I, I actually grew up. So I got to come home and, and pick up an existing program in Montgomery County where I, there was already a level of commitment, but we did do a lot of refining um, and rethinking about the kind of work we were doing as, and you put it very well, Ben, this, this is now a field. This is not, uh, this is something that 10 or 12 years ago, you may not have been able to go to college or grad school and say, I wanna be a government or even a local government data analyst or performance stat professional, but you actually can do that now. And as the field advanced and evolved, we did a lot of thinking and, and, and retuning of our program in Montgomery County to match where we were as an organization, as well as the, the you know, recognizing the goals of, of, uh, of leadership. Yeah, I think, uh, I think those are those are really good points. I want to I want to uh, focus in on what you were talking about um, with the uh, sort of what you you piecing together what you both said um, during these campaigns, these political campaigns, because we all know performance management would be a, an easy and great job if we didn't have democracy that would rear its ugly head every four years and we'd have to have you know turnovers in administrations and things like that. But Dave, you raised a really good point, which was a lot of these campaign themes or these visions, like when I was in Prince George's, we had uh, the County Executive Baker had the Baker Principles. Um, when I came to Anne Arundel County, County Executive Pittman had, had the seven communities. And it was a reflection of how they saw, how they wanted to manage, how they saw the county moving forward. And we are able to, in Prince George's, it was a complicated, a horrific cross-tab spreadsheet that kind of looked like a computer punch card by today's standards. But what we're able to do, and Elizabeth does this really nicely on her um, open performance site uh, in Anne Arundel, is you're able to get the, the metrics from different agencies that are performing in these different themes. And we can pull them together and you can you can get a, a basket of metrics that relate to a theme versus relating just to a department. And it's a whole different cross section of, of looking at data to see how a county is performing versus how public works is performing or how central services is performing and things like that. And I think it gives the audiences, um, our, our various stakeholders, whether it's um, county council members or, or the public or the press, it gives them a different perspective on how they see performance because not everybody views performance through the lens of the way your budget is structured. And that's kind of how all this got started is, well, we got to organize by agency and we group things by budget group and okay, how are we doing in the public safety sector? It's like, well, no, to the point you raised Elizabeth, if you're looking at, at how good are your parks, it's a little bit of public safety, it's a little bit of park and recs, it's a little bit of the health department, it's a little bit of you know inspections and, and all these things that get, that get cross-tabbed and pulled together really are what can 
are things that can make a a performance office not even a high functioning performance office just a mediocre one really get a lot of value because they are looking at things agencies on their own can't look at so i think i think those are really good points well that's all that's all fine and positive and you know we'll have a good time you know crushing it out of the park when we can pull together a bunch of different agencies to talk about one main topic whether it's um you know doing a, a big cleanup program or or or, or doing a health uh you know um you know whether we're, we're doing um pop-up testing sites or something like that but we also face some challenges um it sometimes takes a little bit of time to prove our worth in this field um so let's talk about some of the impediments to leadership embracing um a, a performance program i know that when i was in prince george's twice i had a member of the county council just glare at me across the table and say why are you here like, what do you do um because sometimes the work is behind the scenes and they don't see it and you know but you explain it and and they they felt bad that they didn't know about it before so um Talk about some of the things that that we've all experienced in this area in terms of some of these barriers to get leadership to embrace our work. So ahead, I'll, I'll start. Um, I, I just, I guess I need to recognize how fortunate I am, and I think all of us are, that we we live and work in an area where people are progressive-minded and accepting of this, even the idea of using data for management, and it's not always the case. And, and you know, we can't take that for granted. When I, a couple months ago, in, in, you know, when, when COVID was starting to peak, I think we all probably read with a slack jaw the story coming out of Florida where their chief, their, their lead data person for their COVID data was told to put a lid on it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you, you, I hope you know what I'm talking about. And, let, you know, and was basically pushed out of her job for reporting accurate data that elected leadership did not want to see, have, have see the light of day. So that is probably the nightmare scenario for any of us. Um, but to, to soften that a little bit and, you know, bring it, bring it back here, you know, I think that any time the, the, the progress isn't being seen, the numbers aren't bearing out, um, th that's gonna be an impediment, right? You know, we, we, ha we have a role to be objective presenters of the data um, and sometimes the numbers are not gonna go the way people want them to go. So the challenge there is to then help leadership think about, okay, well, you know, what are we gonna do about it? It's not, that's not the end of the conversation, that's the beginning of the conversation. Um, and being constructive in that way uh, is is really really important. Um, you know, I, I've heard through the years numerous elected officials say, you know, I'm data driven. I want to be data driven. I want to rely on evidence until it doesn't go their way. And that's you know, and that that can, that can simply be a challenge. And one of the things that we work on very very diligently with our through our with our small team is our relationship <coughs> management. You know, is is um, is building the reputation of County Stat to be good partners, reliable. We'll defer to authority when it's appropriate, but don't try to pull the wool over our eyes. Um, you know that that kind of uh, um, approach. But we, you know, we we um, we've gotten to the point that people reach out to us now for assistance. And, and we don't have to go hunting people down all the time. We still do sometimes, but you know, people know now that when they have a, a data-oriented challenge, that, that we're the people they they reach out to. And that you know, and that didn't happen overnight by any means. Um, but a, but a big part of that is you know just making sure you're actively on the same page as leadership. Um, I think the challenge is quite, and, and it's it's doubly true in the age of COVID is getting leadership to just focus. And that's not just a leadership, that's, that's just a human issue. You know, we're all pulled in 20 directions. Leadership these days are probably pulled in 50 directions. So getting leadership to focus, you know, uh, on what's important when you have their attention is, is probably the key. 
Elizabeth, have you faced any any barriers like that? Yeah, I, I, you know, I second with what Dave says in terms of at the county level, you know, I, the challenges there are minimal. You know, we are very fortunate to be in an area where at the county, at the leader, top leadership level, there's a lot of support. Um, but what kind of struck me is the data piece and um, especially right now with COVID, the impact of COVID on numbers, a lot of what I am hearing is people are afraid, people, some departments are afraid because of the impact COVID has had on some numbers that they're gonna be viewed in a bad light. Like it's somehow going to reflect negatively on the department. And so that is a challenge in talking about, we don't wanna just hide something or take it out for a year. First of all, it's kind of countywide. Every department has metrics that are impacted by COVID. But um, uh, I think, as Dave also said, it is important that people know that when we are talking about data, that what we are presenting is authentic, that they understand that when we present data, it's not, it is what it is. We're not trying to, um, I think you use the word pull the wool over your eyes. Like we're not, we want to, we want to be authentic in what we present. And so sometimes um, it, there is that conversation that maybe it's not going where we want it to go, but then that's a broader conversation. What, what, how can we, what can we do to turn the tide and get it to where we want to be? But also we might not, even if we make a change, it might not be visible for a whole nother year. Data, when you make changes to data collection or this or that, it takes time to see results. So I think that that's the other challenge is kind of just talking through that things are not instantaneous in the world of data. When you make a change, when you implement something new, it might take a year, maybe even two before you start to get really good data based on that change, just because of the nature of data collection and the way it works. Yeah, I, 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 I certainly attention there. I just want to yeah. try, there's certainly a tension there between termed people who are, you know, whether it's four years or eight years and, and elections and what you call it, you, democracy, <laughs> as you're referring to then, um, you know, and, and um, the realities of, of making change. And in, in government, especially in the human services area, the kind of change people wish to make, elected officials or, you know, career public servants, you know, um, it, it could take years and years and years to see, you know, literacy levels go up or, um, uh, uh, you know, take, take, take your pick of, of issues. There are so many. Yeah. Um, time horizons are so long um, and you, there's pressure because an administration has a calendar. Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely true. I, I also think that one of the, um, one of the important things um, when talking about performance or staff programs or whatever that are new or talking about them with a new leadership team either way is that it's not, it, it shouldn't be seen as a way to cut budgets. It's not a money saver. It's a performance improvement. Um, that said, it can also highlight underperforming programs and may make you think, well, do we really need this program? Um, so in that way, you could, but, but you don't want it to be um, a tool and you don't want it to, you don't want to give anyone the sense that it's a tool to trim budgets here and there. It's, you can evaluate a program's effectiveness, but um, you're, you're not going to find a bunch of little budget cuts and, and expect to balance your budget on a, uh, on a performance sheet uh, or, or a set of performance results. Um, Probably the most impactful thing we can do in that area is be is act as a convener. You know, get lead, get the get the discussion going. And if you bring the right people around the table or the virtual table these days, and with the right information in front of them to get the discussion started. I mean, look, if you have a poor performing program, somebody might make a decision to actually increase funding and double down on it because it, you know the reason someone could make a case that a, a program is not performing because it's not getting enough resources. Someone might make the case that it's not performing because it's the wrong program, but at least let's agree, like the, the data shouldn't be what you're arguing about, right? right. Like the, the, the causes, the effects, 
the, you know, all those other things are up for debate. But if you have a good stat team, the data itself will be, you know, will be beyond uh, reproach. We had a, um, a question that came up uh, from uh, in, the, in the chat about uh, negative impacts of, of data. I, I'm, I'm guessing this is around like open data um, and it, it could also include uh, performance results that are, that are public. Um, I personally have not seen a, uh, a scandal, a problem, or certainly never seen an administration brought down based on the publication of performance results. Um, there are probably, and I, I assume there are many uh, negative stories out there on, on an open data platform that people could find. I know that, and uh, there are a lot of local governments that publish their, uh, for lack of a better term, their 311 data, their, their, um, uh, their constituent request data, um, and start measuring how long it takes to do things. And certainly there are agencies that can be seen in a negative light when you start publishing that data. Um, have either of you run across any major problems with that? Um, I, I, I sort of, as, as you're thinking about that, I'll, I'll sort of talk about one we experienced in Prince George's County, which was, which was really interesting. Um, County Executive Baker wanted to set up his Transforming Neighborhoods Initiative program where they found uh, six communities in Prince George's County that were, that were deemed to be at the highest risk based on data. And they would flood those, those communities with resources, raise their baseline of service, improve those communities, and then once they're improved, we go on to uh, other communities. Well, when the program launched, we were using data to identify them as best we could. Um, and initially, there were some of the communities who wanted no part of this. They did not want to, they did not want to have the stigma of being a community that needed help because that means it was having problems and it could affect real estate values. It could just impact a whole lot of aspects about your quality of life and your uh, your desire to live there and just just the this sort of downward slope they wanted to avoid and there were a lot of people in the leadership uh, in county leadership who were very worried about that too and i think it was co completely legitimate um we struggled with whether we should have signs identifying a transforming neighborhoods initiative community like hi welcome to this bad bad neighborhood or, you know, because that's how some people would see it. And we had the data to show that these were communities that were struggling. But once we started showing up, once we started meeting monthly there, once we started engaging with the community, and once we started putting the data online, showing that the response times for missed trash pickups and pothole repairs and all types of, uh, um, uh, uh, inspections and things like that, and and uh, uh, police response times. Once we were able to put the data online to show that actually the county was more responsive in those areas than the rest of the county, suddenly being we had we had communities who were requesting to be a TNI recognized area. So the whole table flipped from what started as negative data and turned out to be basically a badge of honor. <laughs> so. Um, I don't know if, uh, uh, if, if you've had any experiences um, in, in any of your jobs in the past. I know, Elizabeth, we probably don't have enough data in Anne Arundel County yet to, um, to really uh, highlight that. But um, Not necessarily for open data per se, but I will say that even with the putting performance data out there, um, you know, some of the departments are worried that the public might not understand like everything that goes on so in terms of performance for us the way we we help balance it is by adding a narrative section you know a narrative section to explain why is this important why should we care about this and then sort of walking through what the data says and if there is an explicit reason why we see a sudden increase or sudden decrease we put it out there 
So having that context and that narrative can help um, round out the story of just the numbers, you know, um, and help people understand what they're seeing. Yeah, I think I think having that context is is important. Um, and I'm a big fan of what you guys have done with Open Arundel. Um, what I've seen in other jurisdictions is not only having that narrative, but then embedding links to further information about that, whether it's a department's webpage or it's a report on, on uh, you know, a health study or a state policy. Um, so you can really get down some really interesting policy rabbit holes um, by playing around on some of these uh, performance and open data websites. Uh, but um, I, I think that overall, you know, going back to another topic we were discussing, which is around uh, working and selling this to leadership is these are things, these are pitfalls that have to be communicated so that there is a risk to doing this. There, no, why would anybody think it's a good idea to publish your, your health inspections? <laughs> um, but it's the right thing to do. And when the community sees you're doing it, the response is very positive. Even if there's bad data, negative data on it, they're still gonna. You're, you're still coming out in uh, in ahead in the long run. Um, we also had um, a question that was um, related to uh, leadership changes. We joked about how democracy can get in the way of a good stat program or performance program, but um, it, it is an important item. It is important to be prepared for a change of administration, not just starting up from scratch. Um, so um, Dave, you you and I have probably been through this more than Elizabeth. We're, we're a bit old hand at this. Um, what, have, what have you seen in changes of administration um, in Montgomery County? So um, we've been through, County Stat in Montgomery County has been through one major administration change. We, we were started by Ike Leggett um, who served three terms and um, was, a, was a, a big supporter of our work. And again, we were fortunate. Our, our, our current county executive, Mark Elrich, um, has said from the very beginning that he's a, a big believer in data and evidence. Um, you know, he's always also someone that um, doesn't mind being challenged, loves the debate, loves the discussion um, that comes along with it. Uh, you don't always get that in a leader, you know. So uh, I think we're, we're fortunate. He's he has um, approached County Stat since he's you know become county executive to ask for analyses on specific topics that are, are of interest to him. Um, you know, and so I believe that through those we continue to add value to his administration. Um, before we knew, you know, who he was, what, what he was going to be like. Um, as we were preparing for the change of administration, I'm, I'm going back in my mind about two years now, um, we, we were, be, because of the central kind of role that county stat plays, and, 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 and one of the, the really interesting parts of the work, and Elizabeth alluded to this earlier, when she talked about uh, bringing people, different departments together, we have this really, um, interesting uh, perspective on county government because we look across all the silos that are there. And, and um, one of the things that we were actually asked to do is we took a, a very active role in the transition because of our unique uh, perspective on the county and, our, and, and the skills that we bring to the table, the technical skills we bring to the table. We were part of the team that could, collected sort of the the state of how everything was to help inform the new administration and bring and, and, and kind of create the, the book, if you will, of, of, of the status of, of issues and, and initiatives and metrics. And um, we also were, um, we served as, my, my, my analysts served as staff in as kind of note takers and so forth in the transition team that the new county executive brought together to help flesh out public opinion on, on issues. So we were, we were, from the beginning, we were trusted with, you know, those kinds of roles. And again, I, like I said earlier, I don't, I don't take those opportunities for granted. Um, 
you know, we, I, I think we added a lot of value that way. Elizabeth, before, before I stole you from Prince George's County, you did have about uh, eight or nine months with a new administration. Um, what was the, what was the, uh, what was the communication or, or what type of, uh, what elements did you bring to the table in explaining how and what you guys could do? So I think my experience at that point and um, what I was doing was a little bit different in part because I was not in a leadership role. Um, a lot of those conversations um, did not include us. So we, um, from from that point of view, we, you know, we we were told that it was still important. So essentially, um, we continued sort of doing what we had been doing. We continued working with, you know, the projects that we had prior. Um, we, you know, until I think um, it was only maybe a month and a half before I um, transitioned out before we really started to see the vision of the new county exec in Prince George's with what, how they envisioned um, county staff to play a role in their new administration and their strategic planning section. So I think from that point of view, um, my experience was the conversations did, were not as broadly inclusive um, just because of where I was at that time. But I will say I have thought about that in my in the role in um, in Arundel County as we're talking with agencies and they're talking about these brand new performance plans, just having that conversation that that the performance plan is not for this administration. This administration it brought this in. They feel it's important. We're getting the ball rolling. But whether or not Stuart Pittman stays another four years, you know, or there's a change, but we know he will be four more years. Um, but the point being, at some point, there will be a transition. But the work of this department, the mission statement will probably be the same. The, the work, for the most part, that the department does stays the same. So that is the piece you alluded to it earlier, Ben, is building in this separate piece, um, which we're calling community impact areas as an area for whatever administration is to take and make their own. Because although, so that they can uh, um, use the terminology they want, but we can still show across departments how that work being done helps feed into the county executive's mission, whomever that might be in the future, into their mission for the county. The goal is to sort of build something sustainable. Because also when you're talking about performance, if you overhaul it every other year, overhaul the plan every other year, you're never sort of gonna have enough data to look at anything. If you always are changing up how you're doing things and changing up what you're measuring, at some point, you're not gonna have anything to say anything. No, that's so, a good point. I, I think that um, a couple of things. One is, having these performance plans tied to a mission statement, because we know, you know mission statements are, are usually pretty enduring, um, but if the performance data flows from that, it has something to anchor to, it, in my opinion, it makes it um, more resilient to, to those kinds of changes. I also think, frankly, putting this online, I mean, you don't want to be that 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 mayor or that county executive um, or the, the the county supervisor who says, "Yeah, all that stuff that shows how well we're doing or or lets everybody know how we're performing." I'm, I'm going to hide that now. <laughs> that's that's a tough position to retreat from. So I think that um, from from an analyst from a manager standpoint, obviously the first one is the most important which is having a, um, a valid data, um, have it tied to a, a mission statement, having it reflect what the priorities of that agency are um, is the most important. Um, but putting it out there and making it visible, I, 
I can't overstate the importance of that. Um, we're, we're starting to head towards the end. I want to circle back to one point Dave brought up that I think needs a lot of attention. Um, most jurisdictions out there aren't very big in terms of staffing. Dave, you talked about how, you know, if you have an Excel spreadsheet or someone who knows how to use Excel, you're, you're on your way. Sh share how a, a small jurisdiction with not many resources, without a big fancy website, without Tableau and, you know, and Socrata and My Sidewalks and all these big contracts, how can they, how can they do some work like that? Just so the, 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 the nuts and bolts of, of performance. Sure, um, I'm happy to. So the, the, um, the nuts and bolts uh, need to just, they need to come from within. And it ties back to what we've been talking about this whole time is a commitment from leadership to managing this way and you know, using the data to, to track progress, show accountability, transparency to their, their residents. Technically, you know, if you have someone in a, in a department or in a more central administrative role in a, whether it's a budget office or a, or a county attorney's office or, a, um, or, or within the county exec or mayor's office that's got some, some fluency with, even let's just say Excel, because again, you don't need super fancy tools, um, then, then it's about building a tr trust and a relationship with the operating department getting the data that's relevant, throwing it into a chart, a graph, a map, you know, whatever visualization is, is gonna communicate what you're trying to communicate and sitting down and gathering around it. You know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna commit to the public website transparency piece, you know, more power to you. But if you're trying to run your organization uh, more effectively, uh, then, that's really all it takes. Again, if you don't know where you want to go, you'll never know if you get there. And if you don't know where you've been, you won't know if you're making progress. And, and if, if it, it could be the most basic baseline kind of information. Um, you, you might, we, we, let me go back to Baltimore for one second. I know we're starting to run out of time. One of the reasons Baltimore was the, uh, the, the ideal birthplace for STAT is because with all due respect, they were just, there were so many things that were going wrong. They were in the, in, in just, whether it was overtime abuse, blight, graffiti, you know, et cetera. It was the perfect place to introduce this kind of top-down command and control, you know, data-driven way of managing. You don't have that everywhere, so you do need to find the approach, but maybe you just pick the, 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 the pain point. You pick the bad headline that came out that day and say, where's the data? around this. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree with you. Um, I mean, this, this may sound like a, a, a snarky joke, but I, I'm really serious when I say this. Um, if, for those of you who are fans of The Wire, um, season three of The Wire is about stat programs. It's about comp stat. It's about the police stat program that the mayor would sit in on that the, once in a while, that the police chief would run with an iron fist at the same time, the drug dealers were running their own stat program. They were taking their drug distribution network. They were meeting weekly to talk about where the money's, where they're selling well and where they're not. And they were changing up routes. And, and I, I sat there, I watched that whole season with my jaw on the ground thinking, wow, this is, I hate to say it, really transferable <laughs> across, um, you know, it's almost ubiquitous across society. But it was, it was absolutely fascinating. If you're into this field, I strongly recommend you just watch season three. You don't even have to watch one and two. Um, before we get cut off, what was the big aha moment for anybody in your leadership? Pedestrian safety. Pedestrian safety? Yeah, bringing, looking at actual fatalities and, and understanding that that number was someone's life. That was part of the vision zero? Well, it's predated Vision Zero. Now oh, it's okay. now it's Vision Zero. Um, Elizabeth, I don't know if we've had an aha at least with senior leadership, but I do see it. I see the I can see within the departments 
as we get further and finalizing the light bulbs going off as they're seeing all their data sort of in one place and how it relates to each other. Yeah, I think uh, the one I had was in Prince George's when we were able to um, use the data to find the, the most at-risk communities and the county executive just saying, because they were in six communities, we ran the data, new data, and said, actually, we should be over here. And the county executive just saying, let's go. Let's go to the new ones. That's, that's where the real problems are. Um, so I can't tell. We may have run out of time. I'm not sure. Anyway, thank you, Dave and Elizabeth. Thanks for everybody.